when uh, Wanda sent me the scriptures, like it says on the inside of the bulletin, she sent Luke 9, 51 to 52. Well, it's actually 51 to 62. And when I was looking at it, I really did 51 to 56, the first paragraph. We're going to read it all, but you'll see me see that I'm going to emphasize that first paragraph. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You ever think that? He never had a house, except when he was a kid. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But the Lord said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. He was challenging these people very directly. Let us pray. Gracious God, teach us, we pray, from these words that we might properly know what it is that you ask not only of them, not only of the people in this passage, but of us. Hear our prayer, O Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. I'm wondering, and I'm looking back there in the... Uh, the row with a, if a couple of young people want to come up and help me do something. One, two. Are you interested? It won't be hard. Come on up. Don't worry, I'm not going to hit you with a spoon or anything. <laughs> now, some of these musicians that lip off, maybe. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question, you answer it for me. When I sh what do you see in there? Um, and what about you? What is it? No, look at look at you in there. Is there something different about you in there? Mm -hmm. What is it? Upside You're upside down. Oh. How about this? Now look there. What do you see? Um, and how are you now? Uh, right, side right side up. So when you look at the inside here, the inner way, you're upside down. You look kind of funny. Here you look. On the outside, you look handsome and good-looking, just like you really are. Okay, thank you. That's all I needed for now. Won't make you stand with me too long. The application of this is fairly, fairly obvious. I actually used this at the two weddings and in the rehearsals. The inside thing, it's try it with a spoon, with a shiny spoon. It's all upside down. Everything's wrong. So the inside, the self-centered thing, everything is upside down and not the way it ought to be. The outside thing, caring about others, reaching out, reaching toward others, is right side up and just the way it ought to be. You try with any spoon. In fact, you can turn. I had people at the wedding, they picked up the spoon and they tried it. Oh, it's still that way. They turned it upside down. Jesus wants to teach us about reaching outward, thinking outward. Just let's be, let's be real honest for a minute. We are entering a time when our church here that is different. We didn't get a pastor appointed here. I'm really just filling. I'm not even appointed part-time or anything. I'm not appointed here. I'm appointed to do my regular job. So this is a different time. And it might be kind of easy to look inside and um, to our own thing and think, oh, how do we you know, take care of ourselves? But maybe the thing is, is this is a different time. What way can we look outward toward others and still make a difference? In fact, maybe make a difference that we couldn't make before. Okay, that's your children's story for today. So the, the uh, passage, Jesus is going to Jerusalem. And we're going to make about three or four points from this. 
At least I hope so because I left my notes somewhere, so we're just trusting they're here. I've done that before, have I not? Yeah, okay. Um, so Jesus is, is going about his business here. And four things, kind of four, three and a half things I want to say. One, I want you to notice what it says right in the beginning. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. I appreciate the old language. In, in the more modern versions, it'll put it, he, he decided to or he determined he was going to go. Or, but I really like the idea, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I'm thinking of you horse people. Sometimes your horse set its face, it's going to go one way, and no matter what you're going to do, it's going to go there. You know, we try to get them to go one way or another. A person that sets their face chooses to go somewhere, they're making a choice. They're saying, this is where I want to go. We watch most of Jesus' ministry, and you notice it almost seems as if he's wandering about. There doesn't seem like he is intending to go to any particular place. I'm sure there was a plan and such, but they pretty much went about with his disciples, him teaching them, and they encountered various villages and things. This is the place where that all changes. And Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem. He set his face. He was determined to go to Jerusalem, and nothing was going to stop that. Man, it makes me think of that live nativity where that one, that one animal, one, was it a donkey, just decided it was getting out of there. It had its face set on leaving. Okay. So Jesus set his face to do what he thought he should do. Do we do that? You know? God does ask us to do things, right? He asks things of us. Do we set our face to do them? Or do we think, you know, if I get around to it, maybe I'll do such and so. I'll go see so and so. I'll give so and so a call. Or when we actually think we know something, do we determine to do it? Now, there's a big difference between us and Jesus, isn't there? Jesus absolutely knew what he was supposed to do. Even when I think I know, I'm just a little bit doubting what I should do. I should go see the such and so person. I should make a phone call. I should spend some time in prayer. I should, okay? Y'all, everybody been in a boat sometime or another? What's the easiest thing to do? What's the easiest boat to steer? One that's just sitting, not moving, or one that's moving? It's the moving one, right? And when we're moving, even if we're sort of moving not exactly where God wants, he can move that. He can change our direction. And so we set our face to do something. God can help us as we determine to go forward to actually go to the place we ought to go. So my first question of you is, is your face set to do what God wants you to do? Now, sometimes we have to say, God, I don't know what you exactly want me to do, but show me, and as you show me, I'm going to determine to go there. Number one, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Second thing, he said he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him. Okay, he sent messengers ahead. He had to get some things prepared. And they went into this village of the Samaritans. Now, the Samaritans were, it goes all the way back to the Babylonian captivity. They, um, the Jews, and they thought that they were, they thought they were part of the promised people, the, you know, the God's chosen people. The Jews didn't think so. We are the, pro, we are the chosen people. You remember the woman at the well, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman, and she says, well, we're different. She says, you, you want to worship in the temple, and we think it should be at, well, it's Mount Gerizim, um, where Moses was. And so they had disagreements about that. And so these two groups that were probably more alike than not alike, they just didn't get along. That's why the, the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan is so fantastic, because the Samaritan was exactly the one person that would sh sh probably shouldn't have wanted to go help out that Jewish person along the side of the road. And what this passage tells us is this. Jesus does not let human prejudice guide what he does. He didn't go by what somebody looks like or what somebody's background was. He did what was right. And he, did, he offered the Samaritans, this village, the chance to be part of his trip. 
We talk about the so-called diversity, difference of thing, and sometimes we think about diversity and what color people are or what their face looks like. And you actually, if a person is of a different color, let's say black, they are 99% just like you and me, just the 1% is the skin. It could be the Native Americans, it could be all sorts of things. The things that sometimes divide us just should not. And Christians should be first in line to say, I don't care what you look like. I offer you the chance to walk along with Jesus with me. Doesn't matter what you look like. Now, there may be some things that they believe that differ. That's a whole other place. But Jesus didn't let, let the prejudice, um, human prejudice, guide him or stop him from reaching out to these Samaritans. He sent them there. That brings me to the third point. This is the one I get a kick out of. It says, They entered the village of the Samaritans, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. You know, he was going to do this Jewish thing, so they didn't want to do that. This was an historical thing. That's how they always were acted. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Okay, I want to play a little game. You ever play the game? If I were God, I would, okay? If I was Jesus here, and my two disciples, James and John, had come over and said, Walt, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and have them consumed? And if I was Jesus, I'd have kind of leaned back and I'd have said, Hey, why don't you do that? At which time they'd have... <laughs> the only time we know fire being called down from heaven is in the Old Testament when Elijah called down fire to consume the the offerings that were brought, and it consumed up the prophets of Baal. Elijah had nothing to do with fire. He just asked God, and God said, okay. And James and John somehow actually thought they had some kind of power to bring down fire from heaven. All they really had is the same thing we have, and that's prayer. So I would have done that. I would have said, hey, do that. I want to see that. But Jesus didn't just play with his disciples that way. He had a sense of humor, but this wasn't the time. I want you to notice what he did do. He says, it says he rebuked James and John. He did not rebuke or condemn the Samaritans. They were simply acting the way the Samaritans do and the way the, the, way the relationship between Jews and Samaritans had been. Jesus would like to change that, but this wasn't the moment to rebuke them. This was a moment to not do that. So a couple of points from this. First of all, I want you to notice that Jesus is not about the main business of condemning things or people. Jesus condemns um, sin, and Jesus rebuked his own disciples, and we see many times that he rebukes religious people for not functioning through, but he does not initially or ever want to condemn the Bible says Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He would challenge sin so that they could follow him. So he didn't condemn the Samaritans. Because who knows, by the time Jesus went to the cross and rose from the dead, those Samaritans might have had opportunity to see the difference. They might even have remembered, hey, that Jesus came through here. And did you hear that they crucified him? And did you hear that the reports are he rose from the dead? And they might have out of that decided to follow him. Now, as Christians, we should not be very quick to condemn anybody either. We just really ought not to be. That's God's business, not ours. We can disagree with people. We can, we can say they're wrong. We can stand for things. But we should not be about the business of condemning people. Jesus avoided that himself until it had to be. But he did rebuke and try to set his disciples in line. Now, let me tell you, if we were looking at this in the Bible, if you had got your Bible open, do you notice, I can see Dwight does, right before this passage, do you see what goes on there? Right before this passage, James and John, they come up and say, hey, who's the greatest? Can we be at your right hand when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus very nicely explained to them, no, God will choose that. So right, they, this had just happened. Now they come here, and James and John thinking, well, maybe we still could be at his right. I don't know this is how they were thinking. 
hey, let's call down fire from heaven and Jesus will be impressed with us. They were just trying to impress Jesus. But what Jesus is impressed with is humility and love and caring. And so he rebuked them because he loved those Samaritans just as much as he loved his disciples. In fact, he would have called the Samaritans as much as he could to follow him. So Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. Let us set our faces to do what God wants. Jesus didn't let human discrimination get in the way of how he treated people. He reached out to the Samaritans. Jesus did not condemn the Samaritans for something that they didn't know any better to do. But he did rebuke his own disciples to say, no, that's not how we act. We care about them. And now, after that, we come back to the first point. Jesus, again, just follows through on what he's doing. He had set his face to go to Jerusalem, and all this stuff with the Samaritans did and set him aside. And he had people ask him about, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, well, I don't have any place to live. Do you really want to follow me? But he had his face set on getting to Jerusalem to do what he had been called here to do, to go to the to, to be tried, convicted falsely, to put on a cross, to be buried, and to come to the resurrection for us. Let us set our face to do what we find God would have us to do. And what is it that God wants you to do? Just what is that thing? Well, let me tell you. A little boy named Dennis. A little boy, not Dennis the Menace, but Dennis. A little boy named Dennis. His little sister, let's call her Sally, was getting baptized. They went to church and uh, got the little girl baptized. And all the way home, little Dennis was bawling, sobbing, couldn't be consoled, couldn't answer them what was wrong. They got home and he finally, <gasps> finally got over his bawling. And they, mom and dad said to him, said, Dennis, what's wrong? Well, he says that the, 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 the pastor... The pastor said that he wanted, you, wanted Sally and I to be raised in a Christian home, and, he, and I want to stay with you. <laughs> I don't know if that has anything to do with it. But Dennis had the idea to do what he thought should be done and had a little misunderstanding of what the pastor was saying. Let's be people being, that are about the business of following God, about the business of being in prayer, about the business of doing the things that we best know how to do and allowing God to guide us as we go. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the great gifts you give us. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. Thank you for eternal life through him. Thank you for the guidance that you give, the word that we can follow. And thank you that in a world that is so full of anger and hatred that we can try to listen and to love, to take stands for what is right, but to do so with respect. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers and guide us as a church and a parish. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.